Welcome again to a Beatles talk show podcast, which is called Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly show in which we cover all things Beatles, the past, the present, the group years, their solo years, their history, their music. Sometimes even we delve into the future. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this show. Hopefully you know me for my other Beatle programs, a syndicated radio show on the Beatles called Every Little Thing. Also, a video podcast called Talk More Talk, which is also bi-weekly on the Solo Beatles. And uh, also for my Beatles-centric website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. And I'm being joined by my two regular co-hosts. First of all, a man who's been uh, part of New York Radio now for close to 40 years at New York's WFUV. He is their resident Beatle expert there on the station. He's done a lot of great interviews on the station through all these many years, and Beatles specials, too. And that's our very own Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hello, everyone. How are you? Hey, Ken. Hey, Alan. Hey. And our other co-host, you know, for having written a couple of Beatle books, The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, also, Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. He also spent many years writing for the classical department at the New York Times and for Beatle Fan Magazine, and he's also a freelance journalist and one of two co-authors for an upcoming Paul McCartney solo career book called The McCartney Legacy, coming out the middle of 2021. That's the first and volume. That's, that's the first volume. Thank you, Alan. That's Alan Cozen, you just heard. Hi, Alan. Hello, everyone. Hello, Ken. And Ken. (laughs) (laughs) And Darren. (laughs) Hey! Well, Alan just gave you a hint as to who our special guest is on the show, and it's Ken Womack. You know Ken for a flurry of Beatle books that he has written in the past, including the Beatles Encyclopedia, a pair of books that uh, make up the biography of George Martin, Maximum Volume and Sound Pictures, more recently a book on the Abbey Road album called Solid State, and he has a brand new book out on John Lennon, which is called John Lennon 1980, The Last Days in the Life, which is why we have him here this time. He's also got two other books coming out next year, and um, he is part of the Beatles podcast world because he is a frequent co-host with me on Talk More Talk. And he just started a brand new podcast of his own called Everything Fab Four. I think I've covered everything, Ken. Have I? That's plenty. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I'm delighted to be here with three people I admire a lot. So thank you for having oh, us. Thank you. And as usual, we have plenty of Beatle news to get to, especially with all that's happened in uh, the past week to celebrate John Lennon's 80th birthday. And so let's start with our first news item. Uh, John's 80th birthday on Friday saw the release of the new compilation, Give Me Some Truth. 36 tracks from his solo career remixed and handpicked by Yoko and Sean. No doubt that very soon, possibly in our next show, we'll be commenting more about this and uh, reviewing it, either the next show or the one after that. Interesting thing that was printed in the book that accompanies the deluxe box of two CDs and two Blu-ray audio discs is a listing of a Plastic on All Band box set. This is listed in the book um, called The Ultimate Edition, comprised of six CDs and two Blu-rays and a Plastic on All Band book coming out in 2020. So that gets us wondering, will this in fact be out by the end of this year in December on its anniversary? Uh, I was wondering if it was possible that this book might have been printed before a COVID struck us. Uh, But there is a a preface in there in the book from Yoko that's dated in June, which is after COVID started. Mm -hmm. So I am wondering whether or not this does mean, in fact, that we will get this in December. What do you guys think? That makes (laughs) sense. I don't think it can happen so fast. I think we would have heard a little more, something a little more definitive by now. 
it, we are into the middle of October now, so we're talking about something that they're not going to release it too deep into December, too close to the holiday. You were talking about having in that right on the heel to give me some truth that less than two months later, I have a feeling it got delayed to next year. So now that I've said that, the press releases right now are going out. As you <laughs> uh, and don't you hate so that I, when that happens the day after we're done recording this? So by the time, uh, by the time uh, I, I hit stop on this, uh, there'll be an email waiting for me about the Plastic Ono band box set. I think it's too soon. I think we would have heard. So, you know, and it being mentioned in the Give Me Some Truth book was probably something that was printed a while back. And if they even had the opportunity to do a reprint, why bother and just, you know, create a bit of anticipation that it's at least at least it's good to know. I saw that. And I was like, oh, good. They are doing one. I knew that one was happening from somebody who's involved with it. He told me it was happening. It's just, you know, a question of when. So, right. But I but don't it, think I don't do it that quick. Hmm. OK. And Alan, you do think it'll be out in December. I don't know. I think there's a good chance because, um, you know, as, as Darren said, I mean, it was already being made up and we had heard about it months ago, really, um, even though we, we haven't had a an official press release. Uh, I think that I don't think there's I don't think there's any actual Beatles as a group stuff coming in time for the holidays. So between this and McCartney three, I guess that's what we're going to get. Hmm. And we'll get to McCartney 3 in a few moments. Hmm. But um, yeah, and I forgot to mention in our last show that while I've been saying all along about All Things Must Pass coming out for its anniversary because of all that Olivia and Danny said at the time of their press release when they were uh, releasing music on their Dark Horse label and there was a distribution deal that they had just gotten, that press release was in February. So that was before COVID, you know, happened here, which was like mid-March in the States anyway. So it is possible that all things must pass would be delayed as well. So that's what we're thinking, at least for the moment. But let's hope we get some kind of definitive word soon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also on John's birthday came the release of the Lennon tribute CD, Gems Celebrates John Lennon, with artists from the Gems record label, all covering songs from John's career with the Beatles and solo. That includes the Weaklings, Richard Barone, the Midnight Callers, the Grip Weeds, and Jonathan Pushkar. It's also available, but it's available on CD and vinyl and digitally. All right. On John's birthday, Paul posted a familiar photo of him and John sitting next to each other in a recording studio with John smiling as he's looking at the notes that Paul is writing. For his post, Paul wrote, I love this picture. It reminds me of the bond between us. Happy 80th, John. Love, Paul. Also, That was when they were doing sequence, sequencing of the White Album, was it not? That photo? It looks like it's that time. I don't know for sure. Yeah, Alan? I think that's... Alan? Um, Alan I, I don't really know. It does look like that time, but, it, uh, you know, I'm not looking at it, so I, I, can, I can sort of visualize it, but uh, it, it could be that. I really don't know. Mm. Yeah, I, th I don't know why I think that at some point, when the, I guess probably when the White Album set came out, that photograph came up in a discussion, maybe even on the show, and it was, you know, part of that, like, crunch that 24 hour or however long it was uh, you know session when they were doing the running order of the tracks on the white album and uh you know they're looking over the notes and it is a great photo i think that's what that photo's from okay well if any of our listeners know please write to us okay we'd like to know for sure also for john's birthday ringo star tweeted Let's celebrate John's 80th birthday with Come Together, Friday, October 9th. I still miss you, man. Peace and love to Yoko, Sean, and Julian. Ringo also sent out another tweet. Another cool day in the studio. Thank you, Luke, Jenny, and Joe. Peace and love. Ringo has been talking about making an EP and would love to see a few new songs from Ringo coming out soon. Of course, Luke refers to Steve Lukather. Jenny, I'm guessing, is Jenny Lewis. 
And Joe, I'm not sure if that's Joe Walsh or not, because in the photo, it doesn't look anything like Joe Walsh. So not sure who he's referring to with Joe. But nice to see that Ringo is recording right now. And as we've been hearing, so is Paul. Don't forget that every year the Imagine Peace Tower is lit in Reykjavik, Iceland, in John's memory. Yoko was quoted as saying, remember, each one of us has the power to change the world. Peace works in mysterious ways. We don't have to do much. Visualize the domino effect and just start thinking peace. Thoughts are infectious. Send it out. The message will circulate faster than you think. It's time for action. The action is peace. Think peace. Act peace. Spread peace. Peace is power. The words there from Yoko. Love the fact that she's still doing this every single year with the uh, Peace Tower. Willie Nelson was joined by his sons Lucas and Micah, being backed by the the, uh, band Promise of the Reels for a tribute performance on video of John's Watching the Wheels, which you could see online. And I have listened to it, and it is really superb. More singing from Lucas and Micah, just a little bit from Willie, but uh, really a fine performance. Unfortunately, the tribute concert for John that was going to be streamed online, organized by Charles Rosnay, who was a guest on our show last last week to talk about it, that had to be canceled. And that was due to music licensing problems. Also, on October the 9th, that marked the 45th birthday for Sean. Happy birthday to him. The ninth wedding anniversary for Paul and Nancy. Happy anniversary to the two of them. And also it being Giles Martin's 51st birthday. Julian Lennon sent out birthday greetings to Sean. It read, Hoppy Birdie to my blood, my brother, and my best friend. Very nice right there. Uh, Speaking of Sean, he performed John's song, Isolation on Stephen Colbert's show for their Play at Home music series, which you can now see on YouTube. Sean plays electric guitar in the video. He is the only person that you see in the video, but he also plays drums on the song, and he says that his nephew, Jack, plays bass. His nephew, so I'm guessing from Kyoko. Not sure, though. Sean says, crazy how much the lyrics fit our current year. You said it there, pal. (laughs) <laughs> have you guys seen this performance it's really good no yeah I, I i shared it on my facebook pages it is you know really is excellent it really is mm. and especially in the middle bit where you have to sing i don't expect you to understand he's belting out those vocals they're really strong yeah. right there yeah. uh in new york city on october the 9th the empire state building lit up sky blue with a rotating peace sign through 2 a.m to celebrate John's birthday while playing the new remix of Instant Karma. A book I've always praised by Ken Sharp called Starting Over, The Making of John Lennon and Yoko Ono's Double Fantasy is now being reissued as an e-book in celebration of John's 80th birthday. The book is an oral history of the making of the album with interviews and commentaries from all the key players, including john from archival interviews that means all the musicians engineers arrangers even photographers involved with the album and uh really is one of the best books out there concerning john and 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 dealing with the double fantasy sessions i mean to hear from all the participants is really wonderful among the many celebrations to honor john's 80th birthday is a pop-up tv channel in the uk and ireland that launched on October the 9th called Lennon 80 and broadcast 24 seven for a full week on channels Sky 371 and Virgin 346 nationally and Freeview 83 in many parts of the UK. This past Friday, it aired a once thought lost interview from 1971 with Michael Parkinson and the 1975 old gray whistle test broadcast for the first time in its entirety since 1980. Good stuff right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you know if any of that stuff is available uh, on demand now, uh, been archived anywhere? Some of the old Grey Whistle tests I've seen on YouTube, but not in its entirety. So none of the programming that, that this uh, uh, channel, a uh, pop-up channel, is still floating around out there. It was a one-off. Uh, yeah, but it's running for a week, and who knows if it'll land on YouTube or elsewhere. Mm-hmm. It is capturable. I can tell you that. 
<laughs> okay. It also includes, um, that's the same channel that includes that 1971 Parkinson appearance, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that was previously thought to be lost. That's July 17th, 71. And uh, it's, it, it has not been, if, even if it's been out there in any form, it's been, you know, pretty tightly kept by whoever has a copy. I, I'd never seen one before. So that's something worth, worth seeing. Mm, I would love to see that. Yeah. Well, also, okay. I, I know someone who, you know, there's on all these shows, they have the logo of, of you know, Lennon 80 or something like that. And uh, I, I know someone who managed to get the logo off. I'm not sure how you do that. You know, I haven't, that's, that's a skill beyond me, but um, uh, I have the, the regular copy and a clean copy, which is really nice. Okay. So when are we invited? <laughs> Anytime you're in the area. <laughs> okay. As for Paul McCartney, though no official announcement has been made of this recording, it is heavily speculated that Paul will have a new album out in December, rumored to be a McCartney 3 release, with even word that it might be a combination of new and older songs. Don't know if that's true. That's the word that's getting out there. But we should be hearing something definite on this very soon. So it could be cold McCartney three cuts. <laughs> very good. Yeah. Hey, if it changes to that title, we'll know where uh, Paul got it from. <laughs> from you, Alan. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, Paul will be celebrating Rupert the Bear's 100th birthday. Paul had intentions of making a full-length feature film on the character of Rupert and even composed and recorded an entire soundtrack for the film. But in the end, we got an animated short, which came out in 1984, uh, which played before Paul's film, Give My Regards to Broad Street, in some movie theaters. And from that short came the song, We All Stand Together, which became a number two smash in the UK. The song has now been remastered at Abbey Road Studios by Alex Wharton who's a name that I just saw, as a matter of fact, in the credits for doing uh, production for the Give Me Some Truth box set. And uh, along with that is the B-side, which was an instrumental or humming version of We All Stand Together. It's being reissued as a seven-inch picture disc, shaped as it was in 1984, and it comes with a poster. In addition, the animated short Rupert and the Frog Song has been restored in 4K, as well as getting a new audio mix. Paul was listed as a producer and writer, while Jeff Dunbar was the director. The film was made in the pre-digital age, all handcrafted. And in the past year, a restoration process has taken place for the film to be regraded and restored frame by frame. And Jeff Dunbar says he's totally blown away by the film and the sound quality. We should be able to watch this when it debuts on YouTube, and that'll be on November the 6th. I'm looking forward to that. Although I sure wish that he had made a full-length feature film for uh, Rupert the Bear. But uh, the animated short cer certainly is a treat. An excerpt of Paul's 2012 appearance at the Royal Albert Hall to benefit the Teenage Cancer Trust is now available online to watch in the hopes of drumming up donations for the charity. The footage includes five songs performed by Paul and his band of Junior's Farm, Let Me Roll It, Band on the Run, Back in the USSR, and Get Back with Roger Daltrey, Paul Weller, and Ronnie Wood. To make a donation, you can just go to TeenageCancerTrust.org. Okay. Fox Business reports that Yoko Ono is suing former personal assistant to John Lennon, Fred Seaman, claiming that he is once again trying to profit off the family. The newest filing follows a decades-long dispute, which, according to this article, came to a head in 1983 when Seaman admitted taking private letters, journals, photos from John's residence at the Dakota as well. Yoko's lawyer, Dorothy Weber, is quoted as saying, at the time, Mrs. Lennon believed that to be the end of her ordeal with Seaman, those representations turned out to be lies and the start of yet another scheme. End of quote. In 1999, Yoko took legal action after it was revealed that Seaman stole property from the Lennons and then sold it on the memorabilia market. 
In 2002, Siemens settled the lawsuit with Ono, who agreed to give up his copyright to photos of the Lennon family and that he was bound to a confidentiality agreement. The new lawsuit alleges that Seaman blatantly violated the 2002 court order when he sat down for a 23-minute interview in which he discussed John's life and his murder in 1980, while surrounded by memorabilia of the late singer. Yoko was suing Seaman for copyright infringement over the family photos and breach of contract and is seeking up to $150,000 in damages. She is also asking Seaman to stop profiting any more from her late husband's legacy. Speaking of Yoko, she is contributing to a new 77 track compilation called Good Music to Avert the Collapse of American Democracy, Volume 2. Following the success of the first volume, the money goes to the organization The Voting Rights Lab, a nonpartisan organization that brings state advocacy, policy, and legislative expertise to the fight for voting rights. Yoko Ono and the Plastic Ono Band have contributed the song, There's No Goodbye Between Us. It's a special remix by Deacon of Animal Collective. Other artists contributing include David Byrne, Pearl Jam, and My Morning Jacket. Something interesting that I never even knew about here, Elton John has a new box set due out November the 13th. It's called The Jewel Box Collection described as an archival collection of 148 songs dating as far back as 1965 up through 2019, and it's called a collection of buried treasures, precious gems, and sparkling collectibles. One of the tracks on there is called Regimental Sergeant Zippo, described as a nod to the 60s era and the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper album, recorded in May 1968, Elton says this was going to be the title track of his unreleased debut album from 1969. You can actually preview the song on rockcellarmagazine.com. I had no idea that was going to be a debut album from Elton. You know, I always thought that Empty Sky was supposed to be his first album, but not fully aware of the entire history of Elton's career. But um, I got to hear it. It certainly is a psychedelic song. And uh, in the spirit of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, it's, it's good. I'm kind of surprised that in all these years it's taken this long for it to come out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've never heard that. Me it's either. the first I'm hearing of it. Well, you know, I'm sure that uh, we can share this article from uh, Rock Cellar Magazine <clears throat> on our Facebook page if people want to hear it. Now, among... Okay, I gotta go look. <laughs> Not this moment. Among the many artists, great artists in the music business we lost in the past two weeks is the legendary guitarist Eddie Van Halen, who died from cancer at the age of 65. So you're probably saying, is there any Beatle connection there? Well, yes. George Harrison appeared with Eddie on stage in a tribute concert to the late great drummer, Jeff Porcaro. This was on December the 14th, 1992, at the Universal Amphitheater in Universal City, California. And George played with a little help from my friends at that show, and it was the Joe Cocker arrangement of the song. So one slight connection there with Eddie Van Halen and a Beatle. And other news, in response to Donald Trump's message after being released from Walter Reed Hospital that he's feeling better, um, and he said, maybe I'm immune. Well, <laughs> that led to James Corden's parody on his late night show of Maybe I'm Amazed, sung to Maybe <laughs> I'm Immune. He's saying, maybe <laughs> I'm immune. Maybe I don't wear a mask because I don't care about others. Science, I don't really understand. Very well done. And he sings pretty well, for yeah. anyone that doesn't know. Yeah. James Corden. Great clip. <laughs> <laughs> also, George Harrison's single from My Sweet Lord is being reissued for Record Store Day on November the 27th. I've heard a clear, milky vinyl is rumored, but not confirmed. Nor do we know yet if the song has been remixed. All right. I'm sure that uh, Darren in particular will be lining up for that. I've already spoke to several record dealers about getting a copy. 
I know that they uh, the picture sleeve is some really exotic uh, location, some like uh, boy Angola or something. Um, <laughs> trying to remember now where I read something about the choice of the picture sleeve for the uh, for the My Sweet Lord single, but I haven't heard anything about colored vinyl or whatnot. It's just a pretty much straight. I think I saw. Um, it might be on Parlophone, the Parlophone label. Uh, I should start writing everything down. But um, I did kind of come across something about the source of the picture sleeve. And it was some sort of really exotic country. And the label is is a uh, is the Parlophone label as opposed to Apple. So somewhere, okay. somewhere that single came out on Parlophone through some, you know, little quirk. Yeah, very soon we will find out for sure. Okay, good news to report from the Liverpool Echo that the legendary Cavern Club in Liverpool, where the Beatles gave 292 concerts in danger of closing due to COVID-19, is now one of 1,300 arts venues and organizations that will receive up to a million pounds each as a share of 257 million pounds of state funding. This is part of their Culture Recovery Fund, which, according to Culture Secretary Oliver Dowden, will protect these special places which form the soul of our nation. But it's not the real cavern, so... Eh. We still got to have something to represent the cavern. Yeah, but they, almost... can't, but they can't say where the Beatles played X number of concerts because they didn't play any there except for Paul played one, you know? Okay, I get your point, but it's still <laughs> nice to have a cavern that represents the Cavern Club, and it was only a few steps away. Well, hey, they might as well have it here in Portland. <laughs> that, that's that's quite a distance there from from. Yeah, Liverpool, but you know, as time goes on, travel gets faster. <laughs> could you, <laughs> you could step on a plane at Lenin International Airport in Liverpool and be here in seconds. I think you're really hurting in Maine right now. You need some kind of major <laughs> venue there yeah, we do. to draw people <laughs> other than your house. And well, I was thinking King. it should be next door. <laughs> I was wondering if Stephen King li lives anywhere near you, but uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> lurking around. Anyway, while it's not official yet, director Julie Taymor has revealed that she is planning a sequel to her movie Across the Universe, reuniting with the original cast. She's been speaking to some of the cast members about doing a sequel, which she is hesitant to call Across the Universe 2, but this would take place in the 70s, and other Beatles songs would be used. And she says the stars of the original film, Jim Sturgis and Evan Rachel Wood, are both in favor of doing it. I'd like to thank uh, Kevin Martin, one of our listeners, for sending me this information. Actually, if it takes place in the 70s, you should have solo music in there. Mm -hmm. You really want to be fair. A couple more things. If you missed the BBC Radio 2 radio specials on uh, John Lennon, including the two-part series hosted by Sean Lennon, interviewing Paul McCartney, Elton John, and Julian Lennon, which I think were sensational, they will remain on their website for a while. And uh, this also includes a two-hour special called John Lennon Live at the BBC. And you can go to bbc.co.uk. And I've also spotted the Sean Lennon interviews to play on YouTube as well, in case you missed that. And finally, sad news that actress Margaret Nolan has died. She appeared in the Beatles' first film, A Hard Day's Night where she was leaning over Paul's grandfather in the casino, and he said to her, I'll bet you're a great swimmer. <laughs> but she also had a most memorable role as James Bond's masseuse, who also was painted gold in the classic Bond film Goldfinger. I had no idea it was the same woman. But uh, it was also her gold-painted body and gold bikini, that was used in the opening titles and posters, also records and books for the film. Margaret Nolan was 76. Huh. And there you go. That should be That's it. That's it? That's the news? Okay. Uh, oh, wait, wait. Here's something else. Now, of course, that you're done. Well, tell me what it is and, first. Yeah. The picture sleeve is 
Angola recreation of the Angola pressing of the 45 from 1970 with unique artwork. And then this also said milky clear and numbered. Okay. Uh, but yeah. Angola, which is what I mentioned. And you mentioned the, the colored vinyl. So. All right. Very good, Darren. And I think that covers everything. I hope that was enough news for all of you uh, from the past couple of weeks since our last show. So on we go with our show in which we have a special guest, and that's Ken Womack. He is the author of a new book on John Lennon called John Lennon 1980, The Last Days in the Life. In some ways, I kind of feel like, you know, 1980, it really covers everything leading up to 1980 and that year. Um, and it's a wonderful book. It really explains everything that went on in the years up to 1980 and the double fantasy sessions, uh, the relationship he had with Yoko, living at the Dakota. It's a book I highly recommend. It covers it in detail. And we're all going to be asking Ken questions about what's covered in the book. And I'm just going to start uh, by saying that um, I wanted to know what you wanted to achieve in writing this book that you felt other books that covered John's last five years perhaps didn't. And also, at the same time, were you pleased with the many books that came out shortly after John's death? Um, well, first of all, thanks for the kind words about the book. You know, you're uh, <laughs> you're my favorite critic, quite frankly, because... You <laughs> No, I mean that in, in, in the most complimentary way, because you always uh, are brutally frank and authentic with me, and I appreciate that. I wanted to write this book because I felt like it didn't exist, that there were parts of the story told in some, some really good books, actually, over the last 10 years, uh, but it never had come together in one place where you could experience it you know, in brilliant technicolor, uh, for lack of a better phrase. I also didn't want another true crime book. Um, we've had way too many of those, and there are more to come, as as you probably know, uh, mm -hmm. on the horizon. And I didn't feel like that served John Lennon's story well, because, of course, what moves me, and I, I believe you too, from our conversations, is the fact that he has this amazing comeback, and he sticks it. He sticks the landing, and that's what excites me about it. So I wanted a story that would allow you to walk with him, if you will, in a New York City that no longer exists, Right. 40 years ago, so I, I spent a lot of time trying to make you feel like you were in New York because this is not the New York of today, certainly not the COVID New York, uh, is, is certainly not the New York City of 1980 and the late 70s. So that was a goal. And and no, I, I didn't like, uh, I, I was, obviously we all were much younger then, but I remember vividly being uh, kind of bothered by the books that came out in the first few years after John's death. I mean, they felt, again, there was the true crime acts a aspect, which even when I was young felt problematic to me. Um, and I came to conclude after several years, uh, and certainly after the Goldman book, that the one thing they didn't do was spend time with the one thing that mattered, which is the music. And it bothered me that, you know, especially with Goldman, for example, I, I can even see an argument for being salacious if you're covering, you know, the reason why we love and are interested in John Lennon. And he didn't do that very well. And when he did, of course, there was almost a sense of antagonism uh, toward the music. So um, those that was my thinking. I felt like we needed I needed a place where I could read the story from beginning to end that didn't necessarily end in a bunch of gunfire and gore in a, you know, an, al an archway. Hmm. How difficult is it for you when it comes to talking about John when it's not the music and you're covering the last five years? Because most of the people that knew John then were people that worked at the Dakota with him or with Yoko. And that was for a very short period of time. So how much credibility can you give to those people as opposed to the ones that knew John over you know, a lifetime, like the Beatles, you know, or a Klaus Vormann or someone like that. I mean, there are names that you mentioned in the book. And yet, how do you know that they're that credible when they were with John for a short period of time? That's a that's an interesting question. I mean, part of the problem is a lot of the people who knew him for a lifetime didn't see him much, if at all, during that period. So uh, mm -hmm. and the few who did sort of had their own very 
specific experiences that weren't part of the gestation of the music. So, for example, you know, Pete Shotton, right, had a couple of encounters during that period, and they're interesting, uh, but they don't really contribute to what was happening with the music. And I really tried to stay inside a lane where the different iterations of new music were pushing it forward. Because, of course, one of the myths, and, and we've known this for a long time, we didn't need this book to tell us, one of the myths that, of course, was circulating, and John and Yoko helped to circulate it, was that, you know, all of this came in a burst of creative energy, <laughs> right, uh, inside Dakota, uh, sorry, in, in Bermuda. And, of course, that's not how it happened. But it was John using shorthand. He would do this a lot. You know, he would use a kind of shorthand to talk about things because he didn't want to get into all the details. They weren't interesting to him, you know. And he'd learned it very young, by the way, right? When he was, you know, even in his pre, uh, pre-double pre digits, um, he would, had learned how to talk about the fact that he didn't live with his mother, you know, and he didn't give everybody all the details. For one thing, he didn't know them all. Uh, but for another thing, he just didn't want to get into it. So he would learn how to sort of compact a story and give people the headlines. And I think that's a lot that was happening there. Um, in terms of the witnesses, you know, whether it's uh, Mike Tree or um, Fred Seaman or May Pang, who only saw him sporadically, I tried to, to limit uh, having too much of their commentary um, because he did spend a lot of time alone. But uh, in, in the case of Fred Seaman, for example, where I was very judicious about what I used and what I didn't use, we don't have too many other witnesses. And so when something's been verified, for example, different activities uh, that they engaged in, or, for example, if we have evidence in the Hunter Davies um, uh, correspondence uh, mm. compendium, you know, I was able then to feel like I was getting enough authenticity in terms of a list that John may have given Fred or, you know, a day that John would later refer to when he wanted a boat or when he heard Paul McCartney on the radio, you know, those sorts of things. The one area where I felt like I needed to say just a little bit more and I was trusting with uh, a number of the folks around that period was in terms of the fans hanging out outside because while I'm not going to provide a true crime book, and I knew that all the way into it, I wanted to make sure people understood the specter of the fans who would congregate out there because it does matter. Yeah, that's one of the things I love about your book is that, um, you know, this is not a negative book in any way. It's not scandalous. And, um, you know, I appreciate the fact that you took that approach because I'm I myself am kind of fed up with those kind of books when it comes to John and John and Yoko, me personally. But um, before I pass you over to Alan, I want to talk a bit about the Dakota, because I appreciate the fact that you go into the history of the building. But what I'd like to know more about is why was that building so important in their story? Because prior to that, they lived in Greenwich Village, and having thought of John so much as being the consummate New Yorker, in the sense that, as John put it, this is what Rome used to be. <laughs> this is a melting pot, all different cultures. I could see John being a Greenwich Village guy, you know, discovering David Peel, for example, walking the streets, you know, taking in the culture there. Why was the Dakota, why did that work out so much better for them, other than the fact that, you know, they had so much more space there? To yeah, I, you know, to me, the Dakota is almost a character in this story because it is so significant. It's a landmark. Um, it is a place where they you know, plan to live for a long time, right? Um, you know, they were they were going to live there for a long time. In fact, Yoko has never stopped living there. And before I answer that, though, I want to go back to something you said, which was so important, Ken, and actually, <laughs> not to, to labor the point, but a conversation we had, I think, last year before we were confined. Um, <laughs> it's really useful to me because I, too, am tired of the books that spend so much time talking about Yoko and rehashing, you know, the scars of, you know, the late 1960s and all of this vilification that just never seems to stop. And I hope you know that I, I, I very specifically chose a Larry Kane quotation where, where John's very complimentary about May Pang. But then he says, but I chose to live here with Yoko. 
he was very specific that that was his choice, that he was the one who decided whom he wanted to be with. And it, we really need to get to the point where, and I suppose we will, but unfortunately we won't be here anymore. Uh, but at some point, I think people are going to stop using her as this kind of convenient, it's almost misogynist, isn't it? This mm. kind of convenient villainess uh, in this story. Because the more I looked at it, you know, even knowing all of this this kind of critical business that's out there about her, the more I looked at it, all I saw was her supporting him and giving him space to feel confident again about his music, to be able to make good demos, right, with the equipment from Manny's music, to be able, you know, her... The, the care she took to take care of all of the details that would have overwhelmed him and sent him back up to that bedroom, you know, mm. um, I, I just see them no matter what their relationship was in the, in 1980. And it's really none of our business, right? Whatever their relationship was, whether they were seeing other people or not, doesn't really matter. What they were being was a couple that was 12 years into a very public marriage. And what I saw them doing was, you know, whatever else was happening, they were being good spouses to each other. Mm -hmm. They were being cheerleaders and supportive. And you can see it over and over again in uh, the witnesses like David Geffen or the lovely story that um, has has been authenticated that Yoko tells about the week before John's murdered and she has to come tell him, you know, double fantasy is not selling as well as we thought. And, and she knows this is important to him and she's been fighting for it. And uh, of course, she's concerned that it will be heartbreaking to him. And he, he says, that's OK. We still got the family. And I, that breaks me down every time, because think about it. Years earlier, John Lennon would have had a very different reaction. I'm not saying he would have had like a, a celebrity diva fit or something like that, but it would have had a, a it would have left a scar. It would have left a mark. Instead, he went right to what's important. And to me, that means that he enjoyed the experience and he knew what to take away at that point. And we all need that wisdom. Now, I'm older than John's ever been, and I still don't have it. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I hope to get it someday. But I, I, I wanted to go back and pick that up. But about the Dakota... Um, it absolutely is a character in the story. They chose to live there. Um, there were concerns about security, you know, and, and where they were living. This had gave them lots more square footage. And I like to remind folks that, you know, they had collected over the years tons of material, right? They've got um, mementos from John's Beatles years, tons of guitars, right? Just numerous guitars. And, you know, today, rock stars have warehouses, you know, Bruce Springsteen has multiple warehouses right here in this region where I live. Paul McCartney has one in the United States and one in England. You know, so they have these different locations where they store all of this stuff that they amassed. And John and Yoko were at the other end, or the beginning rather, of this whole uh, this whole curve that brings us to today. And, you know, they were using that second apartment as a warehouse uh, in a lot of ways. They needed more storage. So they got the apartments downstairs. They got um, the basement unit. You know, they were simply finding ways to build out their business. Studio One on the first floor, right? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you for answering that and, and everything else you just answered. I'm and uh, I'm sorry, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. I, I you're explaining That's what you're here exactly. for. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Alan, over to you. Okay. Um, so one of the things that struck me that, you know, I'm, I'm still not sure whether I agree with or don't, but the, you know, a lot of what runs through this is this idea that John was not confident of his stuff or that he lost his muse. Um, and, Losing your muse, I mean, can be interpreted in a number of ways. Um, when I first read it, I thought you were sort of suggesting that he wasn't actually doing anything, but you know, watching TV, and and that seemed a little a little close to Goldman's characterization of um, of what he was doing those five years. But it it emerges as you read through the book that you know he actually is continuing writing, and it, as you know, I mean, we have like. 12 CDs worth of demos that he did during that period. So I guess I'm just sort of curious what led you to, I guess, conclude finally that, that he had lost his muse and how he found it again. You bet. And, uh, and that's right. All of that material belies 
the idea or, you know, <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it just underscores how he wasn't sitting around doing nothing. Now, I think we can infer from the evidence that Yoko has shared and others that he probably had times of depression. I, I like to remind people that he also was exhausted. You know, he had the Beatles years, which left plenty of scars, as George Harrison in particular had said, you know, we gave our nervous systems. He loved that line and has used it many times, used it many times, rather. And, you know, so I, I think we can all understand that and, and what he gave. He continued working hard into the 70s. He's finally without a contract when I guess the uh, the EMI deal ends at the beginning of 1976. And of course, he's also had legal fights, uh, most notably the immigration fight. This is an exhausted guy. And then what do they do when they get back together? They have a, a he's got an infant. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of life changes and a lot of uh, a lot more road miles on John Lennon at 35 than most people I know, at least. Mm-hmm. So um, I do think that that has to factor in there at some point. He could be forgiven for being pretty damn exhausted. Then, you know, as far as losing his muse, I would probably rethink how I said it now, because, of course, I even when, as you know, better than anybody, right? When you finish a book, you're not done thinking about it. No. <laughs> uh, well, what's the thing? Books are only fit ended. They're never finished. Right. So, uh, you know, I would probably paint that more as a crisis of confidence. You know, he would say to people, you know, they'd say, are you listening to Paul's records? He said, well, I try to, but you can't keep up with them, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> as you know better than anyone with your your current project. So, <laughs> You know, I mean, it's just incredible, Paul's output, and the success that he's seeing during this period is, you know, is towering. And I really point to that audio diary he attempted, along with some other conversations he was having in late 1979, when he starts to point to, you know, all of these what we call dinosaurs now, like Elton John, right, and Paul McCartney and Bob Dylan, who are out there and they're doing things. And he is he has now at this point several songs, uh, most notably, um, although I'm not sure he's calling it that yet, he is watching the wheels, which he knows is a winner. But it's he's having trouble feeling confident, I believe, about those. And I, it's important to remind ourselves just how competitive the late 70s and even in particular 1980 were in that industry. They were crazy. You know, you have these big wheels still putting out material very regularly. Queen, Pink Floyd, was weren't they number one for like half of 1980 with The Wall? Um, you know, you have... Uh, Country crossover acts, disco is reigning supreme, new wave, you know, the grungy noise of punk, although that's not necessarily, you know, turning over record sales. You've got The Who, you got Pete Townsend. It's just, it goes on and on. Donna Summer, uh, whom jo- John enjoyed, a blondie, right? All of these acts. It is a crowded field. And he knows by the end of 79 that he wants to dip that toe in and dive into the pool. And it's going to happen in 1980. So we have that very interesting moment where he lashes out at Dylan. Uh, And I I think we have to look at this almost the way we look at um, uh, How Do You Sleep? Because he, he goes after Dylan arguing, you know, that he's been sort of a sham with, um, what was the song? Gotta Serve Somebody, right? right. And uh, he really goes into his, you know, the most, as much venom as he can pull forth, which is a pretty good punch, right? He knows how to pack some venom and really goes after Dylan and uh, works on that song, Serve Yourself. You know, he's still playing it in, in Bermuda. Uh, he, he's still sort of refining this tirade, this, you know, audio screed against Dylan. And I think we have to see that, and unfortunately, we don't get to the moment where John comments on things like that, because he didn't release it, for one thing. Uh, But it's very much like How Do You Sleep, which, of course, he admits later was not about Paul. It was about him and his own frustrations and insecurities. And uh, I think that's what we were seeing then. And I think he had good reason uh, to be insecure at that point. I mean, that was a it was a crowded field. So I would say it's more of a crisis of confidence and an understandable one. But we had seen him reacting that way before. It it really wasn't nothing. It was nothing new with him. Just like his songwriting process was still very similar, as it would be, to his earlier years where he would work with fragments and those sorts of things. Mm. Um, With with 
how do you sleep? And, you know, also with Steel and Glass, he did the same thing. It's not really about Alan Klein. It's really about me, you know. Do you buy that? I mean, the thing is with, with How Do You Sleep, it's real specific. The only thing you did was yesterday. Sergeant Pepper took you by surprise. You live with straights who think that you was king. Um, the one thing that could be about him arguably is jump when your mama tell you anything, you know, but, but most of it is so specifically about Paul that when I've read him saying, well, you know, it's not really about Paul, it's about me. I kind of, uh, we thought, well, mm, no, it's about Paul. You know? huh. uh, that's interesting, you know, because I, I kind of take him on his word at that uh, because you can see him in other instances, like his feud in the, in the music press with George Martin. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I don't think John was terribly happy with all of his recordings in the 70s. Uh, right. And uh, and there were plenty that he should be extremely happy and proud of, of course. I kind of buy what he's saying there. Um, in the moment, though, I think you could make a pretty good case because of the obvious specificity that he's having something to say about Paul. But, wow, the way Paul would uh, respond with, with much of the rest of the 1970s is interesting. Yeah. The relationship between the two of them is is really interesting. Um, you point out, um, you actually point out both sides of it in one specific story, like when Paul gets busted in Japan. You have John saying, uh, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad he's out. I felt like I was, uh, you know, on vigil for him. And then immediately adds, not that I care, you understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? I was very careful with that one because that was from that book, what, Dakota Days uh, by Green. And, and you know, I, I, I'm not totally certain about that source. I have that from some other sources, too. Uh, and it, it just captured uh, very much where John was. But, of course, you got to just look at those quotes at the end of the year. He is just, when he's feeling good again, and I, I'm not saying it's only because he was being successful in the studio, but he says lovely things about Paul later in the year, about he's my dear one, you know, and calls him extraordinary and all, all sorts of things like that. Um, <laughs> it must be a source of great relief for Paul uh, when he sees those sorts of remarks. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there are, you know, and we, we I, I'm not sure how to take the, you know, supposed diary entries that have been published, uh, not obviously the audio diary, it's, it's his voice, but, you know, some of, I think one of Fred's friends, I can't remember his name, published. Uh, Rosen. Probably. Yeah, Rosen, you know, and some of the entries in there are, you know, almost violent about his dislike of Paul. Yeah, and, you know what, I got to say. Alan, I don't even touch, I don't think I touched any of those. I didn't feel comfortable because we can't look right at them. You yeah. Know? Um, yeah. I mean, I think there's a book next year that purports to have seen them all uh, from Peter Dodgett, you know, right. interestingly. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm not sure even how to take or start thinking about that. But because that wasn't evidence, I only went with the audio diary. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I heard recently, um, obviously too late to get this in there from a source where um, they had, uh, he, he and Paul had listened, uh, sorry, he and John had listened to silly love songs and John thought it was fantastic, you know, really? and of course, but John didn't, John liked disco, you know, John liked a good bass groove, you know, he loved pop music. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can send that to you later for your, if you need it. <laughs> okay, sure. I'd like to have it too. <laughs> um, and I, I just wanted to say also uh, that, you know, I, I, I was I found it really interesting the way you handled the end of the book, you know, it, in a way, you know, I know you, you specifically kept away from even mentioning the name of the gunman and but you gave sort of um, witness views from people who we don't normally read, you know, other people in the Dakota who heard the shots, the, the, you know, or almost took a picture but made a painting instead. Um, and it's, you know, it, it sort of shows it from a different angle than we usually see it. And even though it wasn't, you know, as you said earlier, uh, blood and gore, you know, it was still a very moving section, you know, I mean, you can't get away from that all these years later, 40 years later, you know. 
Yeah, I appreciate that. I kind of wanted to write a little bit of a tapestry at the end where you can almost start from the reverberation of the bullets, right? And then it mm-hmm. just goes out to the future and, and you know, spoiler alert, Sean gets the last word, uh, which I thought was appropriate, you know, to deal with it that way. But, I, I you know, I'm not necessarily averse to naming the gunman, although I understand why folks feel that way because, of mm-hmm. course... You know, he was a fame monster, right? I mean, and and from folks I've talked to recently, he is still behaving that way today in jail uh, with this kind of narcissistic approach to what the, the terrible thing he did, right, all those years ago. So um, I do get that. In this case, I wasn't going to put his name because John didn't know his name, right? right. It, it, and I tried to stay inside a lane where John didn't know about it. It's not really part of the story. And all he all he did was a, a very John Lennon thing. He saw a guy who wanted an autograph. He dutifully and graciously signed it. And in fact, then he even says, is this what you want, right? That's so John Lennon. Like, am I doing it right? <laughs> you know, he wanted, I, I mean, he wanted the A, right? If we're take it to academics. And um, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's still bewildering to me. And that's another reason I wanted to write the book. Um, this is one thing I'll never understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure you guys feel the same way. You know? Oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, of course. So I should pass you over to Darren. Darren, and I want to just uh, kind of uh, harp back on something that was brought up a few minutes ago regarding his relationship with Paul. I got a kick out of the um, uh, the portion where, after a while, Paul was just showing up. I guess at the and um, it got to the point where John had to tell Paul. You want to give me a heads up before you come knocking on the door? And it's that sort of like um, everyday occurrence of uh, a guest just coming unannounced to your door that I found pretty fascinating. One little thing in talking about uh, the relationship between John and Paul. And for those who haven't had a chance to read it, if I if I kind of, you know, got the, the, the gist correctly, Paul was after a while just showing up unannounced with guitar in hand at the decoder at the apartment door. Yeah, that's John's testimony, and I've never heard or seen Paul uh, speak about, uh, d- you know, suggesting that that wasn't true. Uh, it's interesting uh, at that moment, you know, what that was the layover, um, and Alan, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that's during the layover Wings Over America tour, where they rented homes around the country, and they were actually about to, I don't know, where did it start, Fort Worth or Dallas? or someplace like that. So yes. John, so Paul was probably very excited on this layover and, uh, and came over to see him out of a genuine, you know, excitement. So uh, I, I think in, a, in one sense, it's kind of a darling story. In another, it's, you know, the truth about having a, a one-year-old <laughs> in the house, right. which right. Paul should definitely have understood. Um, and of course he was about, uh, I guess, within another year or so to have another kid, right? Mike, uh, mm-hmm. no, no, not Mike. Uh, James. James. Thank yeah. you. I was thinking of his brother, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I think if there were more stories, Paul would have given them to us by now. I don't think he would be holding that back. The one thing I've always wondered about is, you know, we know that Linda is this inveterate picture taker, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, did she take pictures of Sean? Did she, you know, when, when they were there on the famous Saturday Night Live evening or or what have you, but who knows? Yeah. I I'm also haven't seen any, you know, I, she hasn't, she's I, published a number of books. Um, I think we would have seen it by now. Uh, or yeah. maybe, look, maybe they're like, this is the one thing we're going to keep private, damn it. <laughs> mm. And then if so, good for them. Uh, I'm also curious about where the relationship between George and John was in 1979, 80. Um, I, I take him at his word. You know, I was just rereading for uh, another project um, last night. I was rereading the section of the David Sheff interview for Playboy where John is talking. You know, he couldn't stop himself from saying the bit about the I Me Mind book and how, you know, George had mentioned every two bit sax player, but barely gave him any any action in the book. That's interesting to me because he he always was so paternalistic about George and, you know, even when George wasn't uh, writing songs and seeing them regularly on Beatles albums, he would let him sing a song and he would say, so George can have some action, you know, so, uh, and, and I think that's literally the quote. 
But I, I was reading over that section, and it, it's interesting. He he really goes on. He says, I want it known right here that John Lennon is not happy <laughs> about the way he is depicted in I, Me, Mine. And but then he said, actually, I believe if if you read if you read that section, he goes on and talks about something else. But he takes Chef back and he says, I want to I want to correct something about that George Harrison section. He and I are good. That is just me talking about one moment. You know, uh, it has nothing to do with my love for the person. But I mean, in a sense, they weren't speaking. I think George had started to distrust him maybe around 1973, 74, when John just wasn't coming through on things. You know, it started with, I guess, uh, Bangladesh. And then um, when he didn't show up to sign the papers, you know, in 74, mm -hmm. various moments, probably flabbergasted him. But George is going through a lot of change, too. He has a, what well, he has a two-year-old or a one-year-old, <laughs> you know, in 1979. Uh, and, you know, I think all of us parents out there should remember what that means. So John was displeased, you know, I bet he would have let him in the door happily and given him a big hug and been excited to see him. Mm -hmm. And you also uh, do discuss that John loved Ringo and was very much Ringo's cheerleader. Yeah, um, sure. You know, and as Ringo's uh, commercial fortunes were sliding towards the late 70s, uh, John was up on everything and, and looking to help when possible. I, I Absolutely. I love those. Uh, w when you listen to the, the demos... And you hear him say, this one's definitely for Ringo. <laughs> you know, uh, That just uh, delights me. And of course, they had sessions planned uh, for the album that was originally going to be called Can't Fight Lightning. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. What a great title. I mean, obviously, it came from a, something that actually happened to Ringo and Barbara. But what a great title. And uh, in fact, Ringo was quite ill the last time they saw each other. Right. He was uh, had just had some surgery or something which I guess he was used to, given his childhood and, and all of that trauma that he experienced in hospitals, in and out of hospitals. But yeah, I, I find it really charming the way that that John would, you know, preserve those relationships. And quite frankly, when you start taking a deep dive into his life, and again, you you pull up the Hunter Davis book and, and others, uh, you start to see this great correspondence that he's carrying on, right, with his family, uh, with people who will write him. Some of the letters will sort of catch his fanti fantasy, uh, fancy. Rather, I was talking the other day to the Brazilian fellow, Fernando de Oliveira. We, we were talking on the phone about his experiences, and uh, he loved, you know, that John Lennon was writing him back. <laughs> uh, and he, you know, it was playful. He said, can you teach me the English language? And John sent back a postcard that had A, B, C, D, E, F, G, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> you know, on it. <laughs> um, I love all of that stuff and the way he would keep in touch with some of his cousins and his half-sister, Julia, and of course, every week with Mimi, right? <laughs> mm. Mm. Uh, I want to uh, swing back to what something that Ken mentioned before, because I found um, your discussion of the, the Dakota fascinating, because I've always sort of been fascinated by that building, the layout, the logistics of it, the apartments, how many were there and how many did John and Yoko ultimately have? I mean, he, obviously, they start with one when they move in the building. Um, <laughs> can you elaborate a little bit more on how you, uh, first of all, were you ever in the Dakota as part of the research for this book? I have never been in the Dakota, and I've not even tried to sneak into the Dakota, I'm happy to say, <laughs> unlike so many. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I've never pretended to be a TV repairman. Uh, <laughs> you can pretend to be a New York Times interviewer and get in, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I no, I, I've not been in the building. Uh, you know, I really respect those sorts of things. Um, I, w if somebody invited me, I would go in a minute, obviously. But uh, I did have a funny instance. I was um, I was meeting some neighborhood folks uh, about a year ago to go over some of the places that John and Yoko used to go to, and I wanted to make sure I had the you know the um, you know the landscape down. And uh, I was late coming from the train station, an experience we all can connect with. And <laughs> I had to get in a cab and we shot up, you know, to the Upper West Side and the cab flipped around. It did that kind of U-turn you do when you come over from uh, Amsterdam Avenue or wherever. And as my car door pulled up, the, the doorman ran to the car. <laughs> from the archway and opened it up. And I'm thinking, stay over there. That's your, <laughs> that's your job. Protect the building. Yeah. Uh, 
But no, I haven't been in the building, but I there are some really first class books. There's Scott Cardinal's work. Uh, there was a wonderful book that came out in 1979 that did a, a, a history of the book going all, I'm sorry, the, the building going all the way back to its its construction. And since it's such an important part of the story, and it's the one thing that has sort of lived through everything, and it's living now, right? It still exists. It's still there. It's on a new Bruce Springsteen album cover in the background. Uh, when you pull back, you can see that he's at uh, Central Park West and West 72nd. Uh, is where Bruce is standing for his new uh, his new cover, but you can really get lost in that building pretty fast. Um, I don't mean inside of it; I mean trying to capture its history. But it was important to me one because they chose specifically to live there. They even had a séance, as you guys know, <laughs> you know, to make yeah. sure everything was okay uh, with Robert Ryan's ex uh, dead wife, uh, late wife. And it was an important part of the story, but so is the Upper West Side, right? And New York at that time. I love the the anecdote about one of John's neighbors a few floors down looking out his window one day and watching this family. It looked like such a tranquil scene. They're going to have a Sunday barbecue. And then he watches as they begin to hack up the park bench to use his <laughs> <character>. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, that was kind of how New York was, <laughs> you know, and uh, I bet they were out of the park before dusk, right? <laughs> you know, so. Mm-hmm. Gee, and I was hoping that nobody saw us doing that. Yep. Yeah, uh, I bet no, you well, guys had a, I bet you guys had a memorable meal, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that part of it, I, that was like, that roped me in right from the beginning, because that's where the story starts, pretty much. Uh, the building, the neighbors, the reaction of the neighbors, the fans outside. I was, at the time that John was murdered, I was actually hadn't even turned 15 yet. So to me, Manhattan and sections of Manhattan, those were, that was, that was another planet to me. Uh, I had my own little sheltered life in the Bronx. So, and I just, I guess it never occurred to me that on a daily basis, there were hangers on outside the Dakota every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was uh, it was near constant. It upset, of course, a number of the tenants, most notably Lauren Bacall. You know, right. she did not like all of that uh, attention. Uh, she must have really hated it when her her neighbor was murdered and people were out there in droves singing. Right. Hmm. Yep. <laughs> I mean, to this day, if you walk by, there's there's usually well, maybe not in the COVID time, but there's usually a couple of people standing there still. Oh, there are many. And yeah, yeah. I, actually, I find it creepy where it's gone to at this point. Yeah. I remember uh, when I was about 15, seeing it for the first time and just being, oh, you know, I felt a chill, right? Because I didn't want to be near it. You know, it's so, you're right there. And I remember walking away. And in fact, I still kind of feel that way, except the doorman. <laughs> but I guess I should have just kept going in, right? Yeah. Um, in any event, you know, today I go and I guess so much time has passed that it's transformed into a different kind of monument. So when you go there now, you'll often see tourists posing and smiling in front of it. Mm. You know, it's yeah. like uh, it's like you're at the Tower of London, <laughs> which, I, by the way, I hate that as a detraction because, you know, yeah. evil and the torture and the innocent people uh, who were ruined physically and, and otherwise in that place. I have trouble feeling, you know, like a tourist there. Uh, and, and I feel yeah. the same about the Dakota. I can't believe the Dakota has become like this Kodak moment. Did you read Jack yeah. Finney's Time and Again? Oh, yeah. Many years ago. Yeah. That's a, like the code is a character in that book, too, really. That's right. And of course, that is... Uh, I believe the quintessential time travel work. Yeah. Yeah. I have a funny story about um, hanging out outside the Dakota, actually. Uh, It was a few years after John Lennon was shot, and um, it was actually on John Lennon's birthday uh, that Leonard Bernstein announced that he was going to give up conducting. And he was already sick, you know, and he, he died not too long after. And one of my editors had this idea that I should just go to the Dakota and knock on his door and <laughs> and ask him for a comment. And I said, are you kidding me? And they said, no, you got to do it. They're not going to get in. Um, in fact, my editor lived in the Dakota. It was Paul Goldberger. You mentioned him in the in the book. Yeah. So did, um, was he going to help you get in? No, he did nothing to help me get in. He knew I would be thrown out. They wanted me to do that simply so that I could say a reporter who turned up at 
Bernstein's apartment was turned away. That was entirely what that was for. But from my point of view, it became, okay, I have to be the only person to have been thrown out of the Dakota on John Lennon's birthday for trying to see Leonard Bernstein. (laughs) (laughs) I kind of like that anecdote. (laughs) And you will always be that, too. Yeah, (laughs) that's right. That doesn't go away. (laughs) Right. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) I have a couple of questions I'd like to bring up of what's mentioned in the book, one of which concerns the concert for Bangladesh, because you do say here, and it's on page 38, it says, John was hell-bent on declining George's offer to play at the concert for Bangladesh, while Yoko felt that they shouldn't forego the chance to perform on the biggest stage of the year, possibly even the decade. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, the way I've always heard it was that John wanted to play at the concert for Bangladesh, but he insisted that Yoko be on stage with him and George wouldn't have that. And that was the reason why John didn't play there. Well, now, of course, in your great style, you will have me rushing back and checking all of the sources. Uh, and I thought I'd triple and double check that. And, of course, it ends. And don't they have, like, a fight or something? And John takes off. Is that – am I remembering that's what, that? That's what I've heard. Well, you know, yeah. what, what John was saying publicly as well is that um, they were, at the time, trying to find Kyoko. And uh, Tony Cox had just taken Kyoko to the Virgin Islands. And so – at the same time George's concert was on, John and Yoko had to fly down to the Virgin Islands to try and get to Kyoko. Um, so the story about how George said no to Yoko probably is true, but that's probably also true. And in, in one of the quotes uh, that I read recently, John says, uh, you know, if, if we could get the kid back right now on a plate, I'd be right at Madison Square Garden with George. Huh. Getting the kid on a plate, I don't know about that, you know? Yeah. Sounds <laughs> so. like Jonathan Swift, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> uh, yeah, because uh, I know that this program, right, Things We Said Today, does not advocate any kind of cannibalism, much less. No. <laughs> um, you know, you got to give it to Tony Cox, though, right? At least he picked a good vacation spot that time. That wasn't always so true, right, when he would select the places to run off to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. Well, it's important to get that that side of the story straight about the concert for Bangladesh because you hear so many different stories and you don't know what to believe and what angle to take. Yeah, I, so, I um, that's absolutely true. And that is a problem. And, and you know, there are all sorts of, what, lacunae? Am I getting that right in the, uh, in the story, in the Beatles story still? Sure. Uh, where, uh, and in particular when it comes to John Lennon, right? Because, of course, he will often say competing things. Um, <laughs> I think that's the politic way to put it, mm-hmm. um, you know. And uh, of course, he never gets to be forty-one to confirm or deny anything, which is also the worst truism of all of this. Yeah. Now, one other thing that I wanted to bring up was the song "Nobody Told Me," and the reason why I want to discuss that is, and I don't know if any of us know the answer to this, because we've heard many times that John wrote it for Ringo. And if that was the case, then why do we have John rehearsing the song in the studio and it was good enough to be, to be released as it was and became a hit single for John? That is a great question. And I stayed silent on that for, for that reason. So, yeah, I mean, he's told Ringo, right, that they're going to that it, he's getting well, he gave him the three demos uh, around Thanksgiving. So, well, that was later. But he'd already made, of course, the one on acoustic guitar back when it had a different name. You know, way everybody's back. talking. Nobody's talking. Yeah, that one. Everybody's yeah. talking. Every whatever it was. Yeah, and uh, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe it was just John hadn't committed yet to that, and maybe he was more. Co- he must have. Uh, I would put it this way: if we were trying to dissect it, obviously, when he said this must be for Ringo, and he did that little overdub thing with his acoustic. And I think that may have been the ovation before he even got the hummingbird. Um, and so he's he's recording that demo and he says this is for Ringo because, as we noted earlier, he was always thinking about Ringo in those sorts of ways. Remember, he sent Ringo a postcard. You should try doing a song like that Blondie's Heart of Glass. <laughs> <You know>? Right. <laughs> Which, by the way, that's pretty good advice um, in any event. So that must have been his original intention. But then he hauls that thing out for the band and obviously – 
you know, they cook on it. In fact, that's one of the most fun songs to listen to on that stack of demos that were referred to earlier, right? When you can watch the sort of the archaeology of how that song develops. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, that's in August, September. And then by the time he gets to see Ringo in November, he's handing him the demo. So uh, maybe as maybe we now can't... know, as we now know, Ringo um, didn't listen to John's albums, as we know from uh, Grow Old <laughs> With Me. Um, so maybe John knew that and figured I could put it on my album. Ringo will never know. <laughs> well, that's possible. And you know what? You know, we, we're told that he hands Ringo the demos. Do we not know whether he hands him the version of the band playing the song at the Hit Factory? Because, of course, in a way, you're handing him the version that is the better blueprint for what he can do with it. Sure. It is interesting how much of that, um, that version in 76 or thereabouts still lives uh, in the 1980 version that he plays with the Double Fantasy Band. Uh, because he has figured out a lot of the pieces. Of course, I think the the secret weapon in the whole project was Jack Douglas bringing in Tony DeVilio to do the arrangements. That really saved them lots of time, uh, and it it really gave a crispness to that project it might not have had. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the fact, Ken, that um, instead of continuing to say that John lost his muse, that it was more about not having the confidence which I think a lot of people don't realize that with being under contract since 1962 <laughs> and having to churn out so much during the Beatle years, and then it was expected during the solo years, one album every year, for him to take the time off that he did took a lot of guts. And I also think that he didn't really know in the very beginning if he would come back or not. But to not release an album in five years, and really if you're, if you're talking about original material it was six years that could your your insecurities can build up and i sometimes wonder because we all know that john gave jack douglas that cassette tape of the demos for double fantasy and jack douglas came back to him and said this is great you can't even improve on this because he loved them as demos what if jack had said to him you know you could do a little better than this <laughs> I, I I think you're really on to something. Jack knew him well enough, right, to say the other thing, which I don't yeah. think, I don't think they were good enough to release for the most part. Um, they certainly uh, many of them were unfinished. They were just making sure he would capture his ideas diary like before he lost, you know, the, the, the energy. Um, and we all get that. Anyone who's creative understands that. I think Jack was making a very shrewd political comment there. Because if he'd said the latter thing that you suggested, Ken, I, he could have gone, cut, gone running, you know, mm. back to his room and said, you know what, I'm just going to read some more nonfiction. I'll wait for that Alan Cozen book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to hang out in my room with the, you know, the sound turned down on the TV. You know, you don't need to catch every morsel of one day at a time, right? <laughs> you know, so um, or whatever other garbage we were all watching back then uh, because we only had the three channels. But I think that that's probably a good read of that situation and, and what must have happened. And, you know, thinking about sort of the competing things that we've been identifying the last couple of minutes in the story, I think the only thing you can do with this is lay it out there and let people sort of think for themselves through it. Because, you know, you have John showing clear signs and at times saying he's not confident, right? And chastising himself. Remember, he chastises himself because he... He had a snort of heroin. He chastises himself because he can't th think, stop thinking about sex. He thought that that would stop by the time he got to 40, right? Um, you know, he's just chastising himself uh, for lots of things, which I think is a sign of his mental state. But then in other moments when he's pushed uh, by, remember, Dave, Dave Marsh at one point, he basically says, mind your own business, right, about, about that whole issue. So it's, it's interesting um, how... And this is just true of real life. We all live in muddles. <laughs> and John was having various muddles that he was experiencing, highs and lows. You know, what he always said, some days I feel like Jesus Christ. And then the other days I feel like the biggest bastard in the world. Right. Mm. You know? He was a very complex person. Right. But but I think we all are. Right. He just had right. a, a microphone in front of him so much more often than us that he could share that. Exactly. One more thing I want to bring up, and, and uh, talking about John's insecurities, 
A favorite moment of mine in your book is when Yoko goes to Bermuda to see John and Sean there, and John's playing all the new songs that he'd just written. And Yoko seemed like she wasn't all that interested in the songs. But what she really felt was she was afraid to approach record companies for fear that John might, because of his insecurities, might back out of it. Yeah, that's an interesting visit. And she doesn't stay very long. She's not comfortable there. And I haven't spoken to her, period. And I certainly haven't spoken to her about that. So I kind of just left it there. And I've been on plenty of vacations with my family where, uh, you know, some people are just not into it. And she she really seemed uncomfortable uh, even interrupting his vibe. Uh, so I wish she would speak more to that. But she she really hasn't from what I can tell. Yeah. Did you try to interview her for this book? Sure. I reached out a couple of times to her office and, uh, you know, didn't hear anything back. And that's perfectly fine. She probably feels like even though somebody like, well, like any of us could identify a moment we'd like to know more about who could blame her if she's decided she's done all she's going to do on this. You know, I mean, and at this point, as we know, she it seems like she hasn't been well the last few years. Right. Yeah. I have one question. Jack Douglas once told me in an interview, like, and it was like a tease. He absolutely would not say what this was about, although I think I may have found one moment in your book that it could be. He said, you know, there's something that John said, you know, the very last night that we worked together that just, you know, sends chills up my spine to think about. And he never would say what it was. Did did you get that out of him? I did, I've heard the same thing from uh, two other people and Jack and Fred and also, you know, but I, I don't really speculate on it because I don't know what it is. And I, I'm interested, you know, Ken Sharp 10 years ago did that excellent oral history, in fact, of a lot of folks who are now dead. So it's a good thing we have all of that information about people's memories you know, and already at that point, they were a couple decades old, three decades old, right? But in that narrative, and it's not really a narrative, it's an oral history, you see them talking about, who was it? Sid Bernstein. Mm -hmm. And I think if I'm inferring correctly, and I I haven't looked at it recently, but that they're, John's kind of annoyed, you know, that Sid keeps coming around, you know, (laughs) looking for Beatles reunions and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So, I mean, do you feel like you know what that, that conversation must have been about? Well, that whole section in, in the book about Sid Bernstein and the Rascals and then John yeah. talking about, uh, but but yeah, that is actually the part that I thought could be Jack's uh, and I, secret and I, spine chilling thing. Sure. And as the, uh, you know, as the narrative, you know, as the apparatus will show that that we wouldn't have that without Ken's research. Um, but besides that, I mean, I've always thought, well, the way Jack said it when I saw him, it made me think that maybe it was one of these premonitions of death or whatever, or, you know, who knows? Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, well, and it just happens, right? This story becomes one of those that becomes rife with conspiracy theory after the effect. I was talking to someone recently, a reporter, and, and they're British, which makes sense, who wanted to wanted to hear what I thought about this being a government operation because Reagan was worried, you know, that John would come in <laughs> and uh, and would start to be a thorn in his side, a la Nixon. And, uh, you know, that kind of stuff just drives me nuts. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> I was at a, a lovely event for before uh, uh, Sean Lennon's latest tour, you know, with the delirium. And uh, it's a pre-concert thing. And, you know, people were posing for pictures with him. And it was just, it was lovely to hear him talking about his memories. And then somebody starts bringing up the Illuminati, you know. (laughs) And uh, you could see his face like this again, right? And, of course, then uh, he and his colleague, they they broke up the event and everybody went their way. (laughs) Uh, Not long after that. So what it was a wonderful experience that afternoon quickly ended because of, you know, this kind of need that people have, uh, which uh, it, I think it must be related at some point to that kind of um, impassioned anti-Yoko feeling that just has, you know, got to stop. Yeah, I, I was hoping it would stop for the simple fact that she was a widow who lost her husband in front of her in about the ugliest, most violent way possible. 
right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can, I know. If that can't engender real, genuine sympathy, what the hell can? Yeah. Yeah. Well, certain fans, you just can't change the way they feel no matter how hard you try. It's so ingrained in them from years and years of feeling that she was responsible for John leaving the Beatles for the Beatle breakup. And, and they look at her as being an opportunist, you know, who just, you know, um, took advantage of a major name in the world like John, who can't see that she was a major name in her own circles. You know, uh, it's, I, it's, I think the way he put it was, was really still stands, which is, you know, like if you think, you know, me, and I'm being taken advantage of by her. You don't know me at all. You know, he's, you know, he's, he's, he was John Lennon. He was, you know, he, he knew what was going on. That's right. He, and he was no dummy. He demonstrated that to us over and over again. <laughs> uh, his ability to speak fluently on lots of issues um, always amazed me. And reading those interviews, going back and reading those are just fascinating because he's so plugged in. I mean, his yeah. interest, and I hate the fact that he was murdered for so many reasons, but he didn't get to find out how the hostage crisis ended up, right? right. <laughs> no, I mean, he like all of us, he was glued to that. You know, he was, he was plugged into what was happening. Yeah, we really need his voice now. Oh, my God. Yeah, we sure do. And, and uh, uh, if nothing else, for his ability to uh, motivate and uh, get people to assemble on behalf of an issue, you know. Mm -hmm. Yep. Although we've been doing better at that lately, for sure, <laughs> at least in the last four years. <laughs> Darren, any Ken, last question? Okay. Yes, I wanted to ask Ken about uh, uh, his approach to the book in the, in, in the beginning. You pretty much knew a lot of the generalizations of the story and probably knew a lot of things that you were going to you know, stumble upon once uh, your research started. But can you single out anything... Uh, that absolutely blew your mind when you were compiling the book and writing the book and doing the interviews, something you didn't expect, a fact or an event that you had no idea was coming that was the oh wow moment for you. Uh, or maybe there were more than one uh, when you were actually doing the research. You know, the things that interest me at this point might not be what excite other people. Um, I mean, you have to cover the highlights and the major points and, and certainly major points on the timeline, right? But the things that excited me to be able to clarify, and I think all stories, uh, especially in this realm, need it. I was excited to spend time finding out what that damn baseball movie was, you know, because I couldn't believe nobody had done it. I think that's only because our friend Mark hadn't looked yet. <laughs> he would have found it, um, no doubt. Uh, I was excited. Right. That I was, I really loved certainly talking to Jack and running down, you know, his long held assertion. And he would know he was the one sitting there working the whammy bar that that was the Capri, right? That John played because uh, I, I've had people bring that up in library talks. Can you find that out? So I feel like at this point, I've talked to enough people to confirm it. I really love talking to a guy named John Smith, who was the uh, engineer that uh, worked with John on most of the tracks. And uh, he was wonderful. He was very young when it happened. So his memory, I think, is probably better than most. And he was just dynamite. And he really helped me understand. And I probably should have honored his our conversations by putting more of this into it. I loved learning about the politics and the anger between the hit factory and the record plant and the bad... Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, it was significant and it, it had a lot to do with, you know, the record plant helping the hit factory get off the ground and and then not feeling like they were getting enough love or respect for all of their sacrifices, you know. And, and of course, Yoko and John got drawn into that. And there was a long held assertion that it was Roy Sakala, right? Yoko didn't like Roy Sakala, that a number of people had suggested central figures, but it was really them just trying to smooth over this relationship so they could just get this damn album made, <laughs> you know, and they they kind of walked into this political minefield that didn't end for, for many years after that. So that was interesting. Uh, I really love uh, one of my favorite people in this story, and we're fortunate he was one of the journalists on site was Dave Sholin. I love talking to Dave Sholin, who was the RKO radio guy, the last interview that John gives. 
you know, yeah. that afternoon in the Dakota, I mm. think I got some new material out of him about that cab ride. And I'm sorry, they're, they're rented their car ride, you know, they had a car that was going to take them to the airport and they gave John and Yoko a lift, you know, thank goodness for Dave Schulen and, uh, and just those experiences. He elaborated on John singing old rock and roll tunes in the car, you know, and, and just how excited he was. And they couldn't believe they weren't recording it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he said, this is as good and maybe better than anything that happened. And of course he asked the famous question about, uh, you know, his scoop question. So how are things with Paul? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, you know what John said. He said, well, they're great. And I would do anything for him. And I know he'd do anything for me. <laughs> yeah. just, all of those things were exciting. Some of them were just exciting to talk to the actual people that I knew the story from, you know, for, right. for 35, 40 years. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. And I yeah. wanted to ask you that very same question about why did why did he go from the hit factory to the to the record plant? I never understood why, but it was and it was much involved because you know Jack was a record plant guy, and I guess John and Yoko thought the hit factory was sort of more off the beaten path. Um, they were thinking it was about Roy Sakala, but in fact it was just a choice because they thought it would be less off the beaten path. And, you know, if you remember way back when driving in that area, there was a big difference <laughs> between those two locations. So that it may have had something to do with that. I was talking to Roger Farrington again last week or the week before, and he was talking about, you know, when they pulled up at the hit factory and there's nobody there, you know, <laughs> and how ridiculous it is, you know, that he's there with John and Yoko and they're just like trying to get this photo of them going into the building. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of politics apparently there, uh, and of course now one of the one of their sites is what condos, right? I'm not sure. Hmm. I'm not sure. Huh. Yeah, I think they yeah. are. And then I did want to talk to the owners of the Hit Factory back in the day, and we almost had an interview. And I really wanted to talk to them after I talked to the John Smith, right? Uh, but they said they're writing their own book, so I said, okay, cool, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And I didn't want my book to become about the politics, right, of, uh, you know, one workplace hating on another. That's nothing new under the sun. Right. Right. Any All last right. questions? Let me see here. You know, I came across, and I don't know if this is actually appropriate, uh, and I have to be honest, I I never can got it, still haven't gotten a copy of the book. I am was working off a PDF that I got late last week. Oh, I'm sorry about that. So... I mean, I want to touch on this because somebody actually, and I don't know from where he was, who he is, it was on Facebook, was asking a question on one of the millions of fan pages that every artist has these days on Facebook. But he was inquiring about John's diet at this time. Oh, and God. Right. <laughs> in 1980. And it really never occurred to me for some reason for many, many years that John, in some pictures, doesn't look well. And I, oh, I know personally, I think I made assumptions or had heard that this was all part of a special diet. But here is a person who's posting about why did John look so ill? And I never heard, saw it, thought of it, you know, phrased like that. But um, having not found that in scrolling through your book, uh, the digital edition, um, was how much, how much were you able to find out about things like his health, his, his diet, that, you know, kind of mundane qualities of his life at that time. Well, he had, you know, it, it, the official story, of course, is that, and this is second only, by the way, to the Yoko fracas that you see on a lot of these sites, right? It's, they go into his diet issues, like, who made him so thin? What's going wrong there, you know? <laughs> uh, and I think they just use it to blame her because she's the wife. It must be her. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When, of course, that's silly. Uh, so I, I, I was quite attuned to that before writing this book. And um, and look, there's no doubt he looks thinner at the uh, toward the end of 1980 than he does, say, in 79. You can see it. I've come to understand this in a really personal way. I think, John, um, and I didn't put this in there because this is not appropriate for me to comment on it as a, because I'm not a medical doctor and uh, I, I would feel inappropriate. And we don't have any evidence that he left about this other than that remark about his fat Elvis period, right, which we all know so well when he's talking about 1964, early 65. 
he was very upset about his weight uh, and that kind of weight gain he had. Of course, looking back at those photos, he looked fine to me. But you know what? I, too, I will say it here with my good <laughs> friends. I've had an eating disorder, uh, a very a serious one that was diagnosed. And, you know, at a certain point, um, you can really control how much you eat. And uh, I have a feeling John Lennon was uh, still feeling those pangs of concern uh, and very carefully watched what he ate. Um, I have seen no evidence that he had any kind of particular illness. I'll say this, though. He went from a guy who was sedentary to suddenly doing a lot of stuff, right? Um, <laughs> He's very excited about the world. When I when I moved, changed jobs five plus years ago, I remember how excited I was. I lost probably 20 pounds just from the excitement, you know, and the interconnection of being involved in something. And if you put that together with a concern about food intake, you know, it's a pretty dangerous prescription. And we know that this was something that concerned John very, very much. So, you know, as someone who suffered from those things, I get it because you can control your intake. Now, I did read a number of folks uh, who were with him in the studio. And, you know, when it got late and they were sitting around thinking, should we cut another track? And they brought in burgers. John ate a burger. But he was probably burning it, right? you know. So I didn't speculate on it because we don't know. Right. But And it kind of does bother me that people have this kind of shoot-from-the-hip attitude, both about Yoko and also about, well, he must have been sick or somebody was doing something to him. And if he really was eating, of course, that uh, macrobiotic diet of rice and very careful portion control, that could also explain some things. Yes. I mean, I always looked at it like the, uh, many folks have said that uh, as the Double Fantasy sessions were winding down, the album came out, plans were Plans were on the table that 1981 was going to be a very busy year. And he was not uh, getting any younger. He was in his 40s now and not well. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and you got to like change your the, your, your the way you live, the way you eat, the way you exercise, all these things. You know, and that was what was going on in late 1980. Was simply following a new diet. And yet... Right. <laughs> People were like, that, I, and I just, like I said, stumbled upon it last night, uh, and I couldn't find it again now if you asked me to, where I saw it, but they were going on and on about he looked terrible, why he looked so sick, what was Yoko doing to him. It's very common. It's a, one of the most common discussions about him. It, uh, it's, like I said, I think it's second only to the other issue. I guess the other one is, you know, did he hate Paul or something like that. Yeah. But right up there is certainly the weight. And I think, you know, he had his own challenges there. He told us about them. He said, I went through my fat Elvis period and never again. And uh, I imagine he exerted tremendous control. I also I almost made a crack about this a few minutes ago. You know, one of the things that I, I when I would look at their timeline, how they went from being pretty sedentary to suddenly, uh, you know, suddenly they're working all the time. When did they eat? Right. Yeah. Well, Ken, it has been fantastic having you here on the show. And we wish you continued success. I know the book's been doing well. More success with the book. We'll probably see you very soon because you have another book coming out very soon. I think it's in February, is it? Yeah, but I don't know that we'll. <laughs> that, that's an, it's an academic book on Beatles and fandom, which I believe you may have even seen, Ken Michaels. I was sent a PDF, but I haven't <laughs> had a chance to look at it yet. <laughs> You know, yep. but uh, you've got that. You've got a book coming out next year on uh, George Harrison and Eric Clapton and all things must pass in that period. And so, I would, uh, and, and that would be a lot of fun to talk about. Uh, and especially if we have my co-author, Jason Krupa, who I'm, I know some of you guys know. Mm -hmm. uh, Jason and I just we went to the granular level on 1970 and the making of all things must pass and Layla. Mm. Great. And I love how you put in there an assorted love songs. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Uh, and I think you guys will appreciate that. This uh, several times the publisher has tried to hack that off the title. <laughs> they just keep trying to take it away. It's, Do they not get it? Uh, I, I, I thought I explained it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if people want to get in touch with you, Ken, how could they do so? Just visit my website and I will respond to you immediately. Even the haters. 
Darren, yeah. how about you? If people want to get in touch with me, just get in touch with me by sending me an email at WFUV. Now, here's the email address. It's Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Or go to Facebook. And I have two Facebook pages. Uh, and you could friend me on one and like the other one. Join them both. One of these eons, I'm going to actually figure <laughs> out how to make one uh, hold the hand of the other without there being duplicate posts and whatnot. So uh, look for me on Facebook, Darren DeVivo. Uh, the other one I think I've renamed. And now since I've renamed it, I never remember the name of it. It's uh, Darren DeVivo, WFUV, DJ, Beatles podcaster, writer, I think is what I settled with and might even change the next time we, have, uh, we talk here. And uh, that's basically how you can reach out to me. Listen to me on WFUV, and that's that. Okay. Alan, your turn. Okay. You can reach me easiest at Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Uh, there will soon be Alan Cozen 5.1, probably. Uh, anyway, you can also reach all of us by email at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. It's a germanically long name so i'll repeat it it's <laughs> <laughs> things we said today radio show all one word at gmail.com you can follow us on twitter at um at things we said fab and we also have a group facebook page which is things we said today beatles radio fans and there's also one that's just things we said today all kinds of ways you can get in touch with us all right thanks alan and for me, I'll keep this short. My email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. There's a trivia page on there in which you can win Ken's new book, which is called John Lennon 1980, The Last Days in the Life. Not only that, I also have a copy on CD of a new uh, compilation that's a tribute to John. Gem Records celebrates John Lennon. It's many of the artists on the Gems record label, like the Weaklings and uh, the Midnight Callers, who got their name, by the way, from the Badfinger song, Midnight Caller. But you didn't know that. Also, the Anderson Council. And Ken himself, Ken Womack, wrote the liner notes for that. Ken is everywhere. Uh, it's this, No getting around it. And if you can't get enough of Ken Womack, you can listen to him and watch him with myself and uh, my colleagues on Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, which will be next Monday. That will be on uh, October the 19th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll be talking about, well, more about his new book on John Lennon. So for Darren DeVivo, Alan Cozen, and our special guest, Ken Womack. Ken, thanks so much for being here. And uh, as I said, more continued success with the book. Uh, this is Ken Michaels saying thanks for listening, and we will see you next time. Music